In less than a generation, the young Muslim faith had gone from a niche religious movement in the Arabian desert to the greatest empire in Eurasia, accomplishing the unthinkable in crippling the ancient lineage of the Persians and seizing the extremely wealthy lands of Egypt and Syria. Yet as seen time and again, the larger empires grow, the more prone they grow to fracture. Thus, Season 3 of our series on early Muslim expansion will begin with the fitness, the civil wars which saw internal turmoil engulf the massive caliphal realm. In those times you needed a whole house of wisdom to store and process knowledge, now we've got an easier way with the sponsor of our video, Blinkist. They condense non-fiction books into 15-minute explainers called Blinks that summarize the most important and powerful points of a given title. This lets you enhance your growth through exposure to new ideas and information much faster, easier and cheaper than ever before. They've got 5,000 titles in 27 categories already summarized and now offer shortcasts, condensed versions of popular podcasts. You can read or listen to Blinks via web browser or mobile app and also download content for offline access. For more on the history of the Muslim world, check out the Makadima by Ibn Khaldun, a vital 14th century source, or try The First Muslim by Leslie Hazelton, the story of the Prophet Muhammad and how he originally spread his new revelations. Understand powerful ideas in just 15 minutes with Blinkist. Check out their vast library for free with our special offer. Sign up to Blinkist via our link in the description to get a 7-day free trial and also 25% off a premium membership. Initially, the reign of Caliph Uthman ibn Affan was a time of progress for the growing Rashidun Caliphate. The governor of Egypt, Abdullah ibn Sa'ad, had used the new standing navy of the Caliphate to secure a steady tribute from the island of Cyprus in 649, before defeating the Eastern Romans at sea in the Battle of the Masts. Meanwhile, the advancing armies of Anaf ibn Qais and Abdullah ibn Amr were making further headway into the rapidly crumbling Sassanid Empire. Yazdegerd III, last of the Persian King of Kings, had been reduced to little more than a fugitive, fleeing from city to city ahead of the conquerors. After the fall of Fars province between 649 and 650, attempts to raise support in first Kerman and then Sekistan each failed, with the governors of these provinces refusing to pay taxes to a destitute and powerless emperor or harbour him from the advancing Arabs. Finally withdrawing to Merv, he made a last-ditch effort to stem the tide by appealing to his allies among the Hephthalite principalities. Some soldiers were indeed sent to support him, but they would never see battle against the Arabs, unwilling to continue throwing away lives in a hopeless war after the desertion or surrender of Yazdegerd's vassals. His last general, Farukzad, abandoned him in 651 with Merv's governor Mahu Isuri turning against him as well shortly after. With his last supporters defeated by Suri's own Hephthalite allies, the King of Kings finally met his end, hiding in the home of a humble miller outside Merv, murdered for his jewellery. While local resistance would continue into Baristan for years to follow, the once great Sassanid Empire had ceased to exist its dynasty continuing only through a family of exiles taking refuge in China. But for all the military victories of the Caliphate during Uthman's 12-year reign, its domestic policies would soon beget internal turmoil for the young and rapidly expanding state. The aging Caliph's nepotism and unpopular economic policies created growing opposition to his rule from various strands of society. During Umar's reign, laws had been set in place forbidding Arab soldiers from buying land in conquered territories, keeping soldiers strictly separated from local populations, both to prevent foreign influences on the faith of his victorious armies and to protect the property of the conquered. Under Uthman, these restrictions were removed, causing many soldiers in the Caliphate's armies to buy up huge tracts of land in Syria and Iraq in some cases abusing their power and authority in order to drive inhabitants out and resell the same land at large profits, creating a new class of wealthy ex-soldiers establishing lavish estates across the Caliphate. This new taste for luxury among the conquerors drove up taxes 
and created great resentment among both non-Muslims and non-Arab converts. On top of economic friction, Uthman also created for himself a theological controversy through his creation of a unified official version of the Quran. Prior to this, the ad hoc nature by which the Prophet's revelations were recorded and transmitted by his closest companions meant that many Qurans had minor variations in the text from one to the next, undermining a faith based on an eternal and infallible word of God. To correct this, Uthman had a gathering of religious scholars determine the canon account of the Prophet's words, gathering and burning as many of the variant Qurans as possible. The Quran of Uthman remains unchanged as the holy text for Muslims around the world today. But during his reign, some Muslims disagreed with the decisions Uthman's scholars reached, or saw the destruction of any Quran as sacrilegious, adding their voices to the growing opposition to his rule. The long-simmering resentment against Caliph Uthman boiled into open rebellion in 656. In Egypt, Kufr and Basra, disaffected soldiers from local garrison towns gathered and marched on Medina to demand Uthman's deposition and the election of a new caliph. Having been told by agents that the grievances against him were frivolous and a revolt unlikely, Uthman was caught unprepared when the bands of soldiers converged on Medina. Though he refused to step down as caliph, Uthman attempted to reach a peaceful settlement, sending Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet's son-in-law, and one of the first Muslims, to negotiate with the rebels on his behalf. The smaller Kufan and Basran detachments were convinced to make peace with Uthman, while the larger Egyptian force was mollified with a promise to remove their unpopular governor, Abdullah, from governorship in favour of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the son of the first caliph. With Ali as guarantee of the agreement, and Ibn Abi Bakr leading them, they began their return to Egypt, apparently ending the immediate danger for Uthman. But on their return journey, the soldiers waylaid a messenger bound for Egypt with orders to have the rebel leaders executed. Taking it as a sign of treachery on Uthman's part, the rebels returned to Medina and surrounded Uthman's home, besieging him within, and once again demanded his resignation. Whether Uthman really ordered the rebels executed is unclear, with most accounts crediting the message not to Uthman but to his cousin and secretary, the future caliph Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Whatever the truth of the matter, the rebels cut off water to Uthman's house and gave increasingly threatening demands for his abdication, until one of Marwan's servants slew one of the rebel spokesmen with a stone from the balcony on June 16th making a bloody end to the affair all but inevitable. Abandoned by most of his Umayyad clan, with the Iraqi rebels and notables of Medina remaining neutral, Uthman ordered his remaining defenders to stand down in hopes of avoiding bloodshed between Muslims when the rebels attacked the house the following day. Regardless, Marwan and the children of Ali refused this order and attempted to save the life of their caliph. As Uthman sat for his noon prayers, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and a few of the Egyptian rebels climbed into his home from the roof of a neighboring house, threatening the caliph at sword point. Though accounts differ on the specific events, and on Abi Bakr's role in particular, the final outcome was the same. Uthman was the first caliph to be murdered by his fellow Muslims, an event that would shake the Muslim world to its core. Following the murder, the rebel bands effectively controlled Medina, and under their influence, particularly the Iraqis, Ali was elevated to the role of caliph. As the Prophet's son-in-law and one of the major candidates in the previous election, Ali seemed a safe and popular choice. However, his reign would be saddled with the scandal of Uthman's murder, and demands for justice placed the new caliph in a difficult position. Given Ali's efforts to defuse the rebellion and the injuries his own son Hassan suffered in Uthman's defense, it is incredibly unlikely he had any role in his predecessor's murder. But many of the rebels who had opposed Uthman were now his most important supporters, so punishing them would have alienated his power base and potentially led to his own demise. Stuck in a trap, 
Ali allowed Uthman's murder to go unpunished, which led to accusations of weakness and complicity, particularly from Uthman's powerful Umayyad clan, laying the groundwork for the first Islamic civil war. The first stirrings of conflict came from Talha ibn al-Baydallah and Zubair ibn al-Awwa, Ali's main competitors in the election that had brought him to the throne. In the past, the two had fought alongside Ali as comrades. But despite Talha's own previous opposition to Uthman, they had been among the most vocal for action against the rebels, and were quick to make common cause with another of Ali's detractors, Aisha, the widow of the Prophet himself. With Aisha as the unifying spiritual figurehead of the rebellion, funding from numerous Umayyad governors deposed by Ali at the beginning of his reign, and several prominent Muslim leaders, including Marwan and the murdered caliph's son, Abin ibn Uthman, flocking to her banner, Aisha's rebel army represented a significant challenge to Ali's leadership. Unfortunately for the so-called Mother of the Faithful, a number of crucial mistakes would undermine her cause. A great deal of effort was wasted trying to rally support in Iraq, despite most of the region being loyal to Ali. Then, when rebel leadership left Mecca to gain support in Basra in mid-October 656, internal discord fomented within their cause. Talha and Zabir were jockeying against each other for authority, while the secrecy of the army's destination created resentment from Marwan and the Umayyad clansmen within the army who saw the insurgency more as a blood feud than a rebellion and would have preferred to simply march to Medina and execute the conspirators who had slain Uthman, rather than waging a campaign to topple Ali. The anti-Ali movement was dealt another blow in December, when Aisha and her followers arrived in Basra. After hearing the speeches and calls to arms of Zubair and Talha in the marketplace outside the city, the reaction of the Basran populace was divided, with some offering support, while others denounced her. The first fighting of her rebellion occurred immediately after, when numerous market-goers loyal to Aisha or Ali began to scrap in the marketplace and strike each other with the soles of their shoes. More important than any marketplace brawl, however, was the response of Basra's governor, Uthman ibn Hanayf, who remained loyal to Ali. However, reluctant to bring bloodshed to his city, he allowed the rebels to camp the night while he waited for word from Ali, who was now on his way from Medina. A message from the Caliph soon arrived, instructing Ibn Hanayf to give the rebels an ultimatum of loyalty to Ali or warfare. But by then, Aisha's army had already managed to entrench themselves in a defensible camp near the local garrison storehouse. It should be noted that even after Caliph Uthman's murder, the thought of outright warfare between Muslims remained almost unthinkable to most, and so the prominent poet and scholar Salim ibn Amr al-Duwali was sent to make a last entreaty for peace and to end the rebellion. When it was refused, Basra's cavalry commander who came ibn Jabala stormed out with the governor's local forces. A short and bloody battle around Aisha's camp ensued, Many on both sides died, but the rebels were not dislodged. Afterwards, an uneasy ceasefire was signed, intended to last until Ali's arrival. The ceasefire would be short-lived, however. If Aisha remained unwilling to submit, Ali's arrival would only leave the rebels hopelessly outnumbered. So, on Talha's advice, a party of rebels captured the Basran governor in a surprise raid as he led the evening's prayers in the mosque, giving him 40 lashes and plucking his beard and eyelashes before imprisoning him. The following morning, Zubayr's son Abdallah led the rebels in an attack on the storehouse, killing 40 converted ex-slaves from Sindh who had been posted as guards, and seizing the grain meant for the townfolk's winter provisions. Who came arrived shortly after in a great rage, demanding Abdallah release the governor and berating him for the killing of Muslims innocent of any role in Uthman's murder. When Abdallah refused, who came attacked with the 700 men still with him, finding himself quickly surrounded and overwhelmed by the larger rebel army. Though he fought fiercely until the end, 
fatally striking one of the rebels with his own severed leg, according to one rather fanciful account, who came, his son, and many of his soldiers were killed, with the rest fleeing or surrendering, and leaving the rebels in full control of Basra. With Ali en route, the victorious rebels had little time to gather support for their movement. Though control of the city and its treasury brought most of the surrounding tribes at least nominally under Aisha's banner, emissaries sent north to Kufa had less success. While the province's governor, Abu Musa ibn Ashari, attempted to remain neutral, Kufan notable Zayd ibn Suhan, after receiving a message from Aisha fondly addressing him as a beloved son, as befitting her title of Mother of the Faith, responded that her beloved son would prefer her to stay safely at home. Ali's efforts were more fruitful. Sending his son al Hassan to Kufa, Abu Musa was soon deposed, and more than 6,000 men were gathered for the retaking of Basra. With these joining Ali's 700 from Medina, and close to 2,000 who had gathered from various tribes along the caravan route, Ali arrived at Basra on December 5th with just under 10,000 men, met by Aisha's comparable army of Basrans and Meccans. After three days of standoff and attempts to sway the Basran tribes, a horseman was sent between the armies by Ali with a Quran at the end of his lance to exhort both sides to an honorable combat. When he fell dead, pierced by arrows, battle was joined, and the two cavalry-heavy armies came crashing together like thunder. Despite Aisha having, by most accounts, at least as large an army as Ali prior to his arrival, defections of several Basran tribes, both before and during the battle, weakened her force significantly. In the center of Ali's army, Abu Qatada al-Numan led the Kufan foot soldiers, while Ali's son, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, carried his father's standard. On the right wing of Ali's army, Malik al-Ashtar led the bulk of the Kufan cavalry, soon routing the tribesmen of the Banu Hanzala leading Aisha's left. And on Ali's left, the storied companion Amar ibn Yasir is said by some to have driven Zubayr, who had been given overall command of the rebel army, to abandon his army and leave without fighting. Zubayr's desertion is a matter of some mystery, Despite his past victories and talent as a commander, all accounts agree he abandoned his army and retreated very early in the battle, though there are a variety of reasons given. Some suggest that secret correspondence from Ali convinced him he had taken the wrong path, or that the Prophet had once said that Amar would die at the hands of a band of wicked men, leading Zubayr to question his role when the two came face to face on the battlefield. Others point to Aisha's refusal to acclaim him as Caliph on the eve of the battle, suggesting that she favoured Talha and that Zubayr's role in the rebellion had been a self-serving grab for the throne. Either way, his desertion left Talha to take command of a rapidly worsening situation. Leading a strong force of Basran cavalry, he made a number of charges against Ali's left and centre, at first with great success. But once Ali's right wing punched through his lines, he found his mobile cavalry bogged down and risking envelopment. Turning about to withdraw and regroup for another charge, he was mortally wounded by an arrow to the back of his knee, not at the hands of Ali's forces, but of his supposed ally Marwan, apparently as a spiteful act of vengeance for Talha's opposition to Uthman now that their alliance to punish Ali and Uthman's murderers had come to naught. After firing the treacherous shot, Marwan was taken prisoner by Ali's victorious forces, while Aisha's leaderless forces collapsed. Named the Battle of the Camel after the camel Aisha had observed her defeat from the back of, this climactic battle in Basra had ended the first major challenge to Ali's caliphate, though further conflict remained ahead. Various figures are given for the casualties, with generally accepted figures hovering around 400 for Ali's army and 2,500 for Aisha's, the latter number being particularly high given that Ali pardoned all but one of the prisoners taken after the battle, but still plausible given the accounts of many rebels fighting on long after the army had fallen into disarray and defeat out of zealous devotion to Aisha. 
Of the three rebel leaders, only Aisha survived the battle and its aftermath, being escorted back to Medina by her brother Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, where she would live her days out in comfort but with her political activity greatly curtailed. Zubair was found shortly after the battle's end by a trio of tribesmen and murdered while apparently trying to escape to his ally Muawiyah, the governor of Syria. The new caliph had triumphed in the first test of his rule, but Ali's throne would not remain secure for long. In this series' next episode, rebellion will engulf the caliphate once more, as internal turmoil becomes a grim new norm in the Islamic world. Season 3 of the Early Muslim Conquests will continue soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.